For over two millennia, sugar has been humanity's favorite way to sweeten, transforming simple desserts, rounding out sauces, and adding that irresistible shell to a perfectly glazed donut. However, its potential stretches far beyond the kitchen, even standing as a cleaner alternative to traditional oil-based fossil fuels. While enjoying it is second nature, turning fresh stalks and beets into those glittering granules demands some sophisticated chemistry. Get ready for a journey through sweet science, because today we're getting the inside scoop on how this crystalline treasure is taken from raw cane to its refined finish. Around the world, virtually all granulated sugar originates from just two primary crops, sugarcane and sugar beets, with cane supplying close to 80% of global production. Sugarcane is a true tropical grass, thriving in hot, humid climates closer to the equatorial belt, whereas sugar beets grow best in milder, temperate regions farther from the tropics. Even though cane and beet sugars start from different crops and have different processing methods, their end product is virtually identical. A clear crystalline granule composed of 99.95% sucrose, leaving only tiny variations within their trace minerals that most consumers would never notice. Since most of the world's supply starts with cane, we'll begin there and follow how the stalks are grown, cut, and rushed to the factory. Sugarcane is a tall, perennial grass planted using what are known as seed canes instead of tiny grain-like seeds. Each seed cane is a cut section of stalk that's trimmed so it contains several buds, or eyes, and every eye can sprout into a genetically identical copy of its parent plant. When laid end-to-end -end in long furrows and covered with soil, these cuttings send up shoots that thicken into solid stalks of cane taking roughly 10 to 18 months to reach full maturity. Throughout that stretch, the stalks concentrate natural sugars inside their fibrous internodes, while farmers fine-tune irrigation, weed control, and fertilizer, so the crop hits its peak sucrose level. Once the fields are filled with towering stalks 10 to 20 feet high, it's a telling sign the crop is ready to harvest. As a final check that the crop is sweet enough, the farmer tests the juice with this handheld refractometer, reading the bricks value to confirm the stalks are hitting roughly 16 to 20% sugar before committing to a full harvest. Once the levels look good, the real heavy hitter rolls in. This 45,000 pound cane harvester built to chew through more than 20 acres in a single day. It starts by topping the plants, using spinning blades to slice off the leafy heads then angled scrolls guide the cane inward while knockdown rollers push the stalks over so they can be cut cleanly at the base. Inside the machine, the stalks are chopped into 10-inch sections called billets, carried up the slatted conveyor, then dropped into a collector bin keeping pace alongside. And because sugarcane is a perennial grass, the cane stubbles can send up new shoots after they've been cut meaning the field can produce three to six harvests without replanting every year. When the collection wagon fills, the 20-ton bins are tipped into waiting trucks bound for the mill, and they have to move fast because once cane is cut, its sugar content begins to decline, and any damage during harvest speeds up that loss. Now at the mill, each 20-ton bin of cane billets are tipped onto a receiving belt that moves them beneath a high-volume pre-wash, knocking off stones, clumps of dirt, and stray leaves. To unlock as much sucrose as possible, the billets first enter this shredding unit, where large spinning serrated blades tear the cane into shredded fragments, creating far more surface area for extraction. Those shreds feed through this succession of hammer mills where each heavy roller applies progressively tighter pressure. And after the first roller pass, water is sent into the mills to help leach out every drop of sugar-rich liquid from the plant fibers. 
The resulting wet mash flowing out of the last mill is routed into separation equipment that diverts the sugar-rich juice away from the fibrous residue called bagasse. Rather than becoming waste, the leftover bagasse feeds directly into these boiler furnaces, generating steam that powers turbines to produce all the facility's electricity. Now the extracted juice coming out of the mills is still loaded with a murky mix of sucrose, clay, sand, and shredded fibers. So it needs to be clarified. Inside this clarification tank, the liquid is aerated to loosen dirt and trapped particles. Then, a worker pours in powdered lime. The lime acts as a coagulant, forcing the dirt particles to clump into a floating muddy layer called scum. Then, rotating paddles skim it away. The clarified juice is then heated to roughly 230 degrees Fahrenheit to deactivate enzymes and reduce microbial load, turning it into a clear sweet juice with a color similar to brewed tea. And to squeeze out every last drop of sugar, the muddy settlement that was skimmed away is sluiced over this large, slowly rotating vacuum drum wrapped in perforated screens. Inside, strong suction draws any remaining juice inward through the screens, while a layer of semi-dry mud builds up on the outside and is scraped off, later returning to the fields as a nutrient-rich fertilizer. At this point, the clarified juice is far too watery to be crystallized, so it's sent through this series of vacuum evaporators. These machines lower the atmospheric pressure, allowing the water to boil away at just 160 degrees Fahrenheit. This gentle heat thickens the watery liquid into a dense syrup without caramelizing the sugars, setting up the perfect conditions for crystals to start forming. That syrup is then pumped into these tall crystallization pans where it continues to boil under vacuum. Then an operator pours in this milky seed slurry of ultra-fine sugar crystals suspended in isopropyl alcohol. Just 16 ounces contains trillions of tiny microscopic crystals, each acting as a nucleus for the sucrose molecules to deposit and grow. As time passes, the boiling mixture, now called massaquate, develops into growing sugar crystals floating in a thick brown syrup that will later be extracted as molasses. While it's boiling, an operator periodically draws a proof sample of the massaquate, spreading a bit on a glass slide to inspect the size and distribution of crystals and decide when the batch is ready. Once the crystals reach about 1 mm, the massaquate is discharged into this industrial centrifuge spinning at 1200 rpm. The spin forces the viscous molasses outward and through the perforated basket, while the solid sugar crystals remain on the screen. A quick spray of water adjusts how much molasses film stays on the granules, and for raw cane sugar, just enough is left to give a warm, caramel tint. The stripped-away molasses is pumped to these outdoor holding tanks, waiting to be sold as a versatile sweetener, from cookie recipes to rum production. The damp sugar granules pour into this long, slow-turning rotary dryer, where hot air continuously flows through. Internal flights lift and cascade the granules repeatedly, creating constant movement that circulates the air, preventing clumping and keeping the sugar free-flowing. What rolls out of the dryer is pure raw cane sugar, also called turbinado, a pale brown crystal with a mild caramel flavor and a noticeably coarser texture than typical table sugar. And it's especially useful in industrial chocolate and candy making, or premium sugar blends. To wrap up the milling phase, the raw sugar is conveyed into this holding shed with a capacity exceeding 150,000 tons. It waits here for transport, eventually heading out in truckloads or aboard this barge carrying 27,000 tons headed to the refinery. The final stop where this coarse sweetener is converted into the table sugar we use every day, and we're following this delivery to see exactly how that's done. At some refineries, the raw sugar will arrive by truck, but the biggest operations sit right on major waterways, so barges can deliver 27,000 tons in a single load. Once the vessel docks, a special crane inside the ship's hold scoops the raw sugar onto a conveyor that carries it indoors. The stream falls into stockpile mountains within this giant hangar, built to hold 108,000 tons, or four entire shiploads. 
From the holding shed, a wheel loader shovels the raw sugar through floor grates, dropping it onto a belt that runs straight into the refinery. This begins the initial wash cycle called affination. In this large mingling trough, the crystals are mixed with warm water, molasses, and a hot concentrated syrup known as raw wash, forming a wet sandy mixture called magma. That magma then feeds into a centrifuge spinning at 1200 RPM, where the wash syrup and molasses are flung away from the granules. Then, a controlled spray of water helps strip off impurities and about 30% of the color, leaving behind a lighter product known as washed raw sugar. Next, the washed sugar is melted in 176 degrees Fahrenheit water, creating what refiners call melt liquor, a dense concentrated liquid that's 65% sucrose, and it must be kept warm so it doesn't recrystallize. This warm liquid sugar is then pushed through a cloth filter that traps any larger bits of dirt, so the output is a clear, particle-free liquor. To clean it even further, they follow that up by a clarification step called phosphatation. Lime and food-grade phosphoric acid are dosed into the liquor, then air is bubbled through, causing remaining impurities to form a frothy scum that floats, that's skimmed off by these rotating paddles, revealing clear clarified liquor underneath. Excess water is then removed inside this vacuum evaporator vessel, where the reduced pressure lets the syrup boil at only 160 degrees without scorching the sugars. As it concentrates, the liquor climbs from 65 to 78 percent solids, giving the syrup the ideal thickness needed for recrystallization. Once the concentration is in range, a new batch of finely ground sugar seed is added to the vessel. This slurry will give the dissolved sucrose molecules trillions of tiny surfaces to latch onto and grow, thickening the syrup back into massaquate, a dense mixture of molasses and growing sugar grains. After an operator confirms the crystals are just the right size, the massaquate is sent through a final centrifuge that spins off the molasses. This spin cycle also determines whether the batch becomes brown sugar or classic white table sugar. To create brown sugar, the water spray is adjusted to intentionally leave a 3 to 10% coating of molasses on the crystals, depending on the desired grade. For white sugar, the spin and rinse continues until every trace of molasses is completely washed away. The separated molasses is captured and looped back into the system to help clean the next incoming batch of raw cane sugar. From there, their paths diverge. Brown sugar travels through this spiral cooler, gently dropping the temperature so the crystals don't set into a solid block before they reach the bagging line. While the still damp white sugar passes through a large rotary dryer, where warm dry air circulates through the crystals, keeping them loose and pourable. Both streams then converge at the packaging floor, where high-speed fillers crank out two and four-pound bags at over 200,000 every day. They're stacked on pallets, shrink-wrapped, and sent off to stores, destined to sweeten the day from that first cup of coffee to the last cookie in the jar. Thanks for tuning in to Made Vision. Don't forget to check out our other videos for more fascinating content.